we are back. Uh, missed yesterday because I was sick and uh, got no sleep, and I wasn't going to get any learning done. So we're back today, starting uh, with part 10 of the Blender Donut. Um, finished part 9 yesterday with geometry nodes. Well, not, not yesterday, last time we were doing this. Um, you can still hear a little bit of sniffles. I'll probably have my mic off most of the time. Um, but we've got the stream going for documenting reasons. And let's jump into it. So our donut is uh, referencing a single sprinkle. It's doing a good job. We set it all up correctly. We've got these little controls here if I want to change the density of things later on. Did a good job there. Uh, but now we're going to make it look even better. Um, so basically no two sprinkles are the same. Um, you could see that not just the colors are different, but also the shapes of them, right? Because um, I believe it's actually like piping. So they like pipe out this uh, like hard, uh, sorry, like a, like a liquid thing. And then once it's hard, then they like chop it with a knife. So some of them come out like all squiggly, some of them come out straight, um, but they all look uh, a little bit different. So yeah, let's uh, let's do that. First of all, though, let's let's make this look not so sharp because they end up being like rounded on the edges, right? They kind of look like, I mean, not quite a tic tac, but it's rounded on the edge there. So to do that, I want to use a subsurf modifier, which you may remember we used uh, we've used a lot, really. Um, so for that, uh, you could go in here and add it as a modifier, but the hotkey, if you want to know that, it's Control One. That'll add in a subsurf of level one. Control two would do level two, three, four, etc. So I'm just going to go control uh, control one. Whoops, hmm? one. Okay, um, and also make sure render is just set to one because yeah, we definitely don't need that much detail for our final render. All right now it's it's doing this weird pinching thing, um, but that makes sense for our mesh because you may remember when we talked about subsurf. It's like the way it works is it takes you know three vertices like that in which case this is a right angle and then it is blending the two across it like that so of course it's going to look uh it's going to look very pinched going that way so what we need to do is add in more detail it here just looks so like i'm going to add in a loop cut okay so I'm, i don't think we talked about this but a loop cut is uh yeah it's basically what this is right here i want to make one happen here and to do that i'm going to hit control r um, in fact let me just turn on my Two, so it's actually handy. Control R, there we go. Um, and you'll get this little yellow line that'll appear. Um, so that'll ask you like which part of the mesh do you wanna put it on? So I wanna put it here, click. And then I wanna drag this over to the left-hand side and then do another click. And then I'm gonna hit Control R again, click, and then drag this over for the other end. And now that looks a lot better. Mm -hmm. And if I went and hit Shade Smooth, you should see that our, uh, our sprinkles look a lot nicer now. Um, if you really want, like, you can kind of see, eh, I mean, can you see it? But it looks a little messy in the end there. I mean, if you were really, like, a knock for, uh, like, making things look really nice, you would add, like, an inset here to just clean up that end a little bit better. But look, I mean, that's going <laughs> to, it's going to slow down your render, and you've got it for every sprinkle, and it's like, yeah, who cares? <laughs> so we're just going to go with that. Okay, cool. So let's uh, let's add some variants of this, okay? So we've got... Single sprinkle, in fact, might as well just rename this over here, sprinkle. And then I'm gonna duplicate it with Shift D, and then I'm gonna put it right next to it, just on its uh, X axis, like that. Doesn't matter where you put it, by the way, it's just I'm trying to keep it neat. Um, and then um, looking at reference, you can see that, wow, you got some really long ones. Okay, so let's do that. Let's make, uh, okay, so I'm going to go into wireframe mode so that I can see through it, and then vertex mode vertex select mode, which you can also do by hitting uh, number one on your keyboard or two for the edges and then three for the faces. So one, two, or three. All right, and then I'm gonna click over this to box select and I'm just gonna drag this out. And this is gonna be a long one. Um, but long ones, when they're long, they kind of get squiggly, I would imagine, <laughs> maybe. So I'm gonna add in one loop cut here, control R, click, and then I'll just right click and then I'll just make this eh, bow out a little bit that way. And then this one, I'll do this here as well. So it's just, I don't know, it's not perfectly straight, right? Um, and then I'll do this one again, and let's make this one short and fat. Short like that. <laughs> Maybe. So I'm gonna add
it in one loop cut here, control R, click, and then I'll just right click, and then I'll just make this eh, bow out a little bit that way, and then this one I'll do this here as well. So it's just, I don't know, it's not perfectly straight, right? Um, and then I'll do this one again, and let's make this one short and fat. Short like that. Um, and by the way, the that little point in the middle there, we haven't talked about this before, but every object has an origin point, which is kind of, I guess the way to think of it, like that's where it rotates from, that's where, like the center of it. It's kind of like the center of the mass. Um, so that's actually where it will, will place it on it. So if I actually wanted it to be rested, not in the middle of it across here, um, but on like the end. So like the sprinkles are kind of perched on top of the surface. I would put it up like that. Um, but I don't, I want them to be half submerged because I think that's how, how it usually works when it falls in the icing, it becomes half submerged. So it's fine. Um, but I do want it to be sort of in the center. Move that across. Okay. All right. So that's a short fat one. And now let's make some squiggly ones. So you can see over here, got some long squiggly weird looking pieces. So I'm going to duplicate this one and let's add two loop cuts. So you can increase the number of loop cuts after you've, once you've got it active and it's asking you where to put it, uh, if you use your scroll wheel, it's now increasing the number of loop cuts. So I'm going to create two, click and then right click and I'll move this over. Uh, in fact, I might, okay, I'll go into vertex. Uh, what is this? Not solid view, wireframe mode and then click and drag. And I'm going to turn on proportional editing and now I'm going to rotate and then I'll do the same for this side. Haha. -ha. Look at us now. It's coming along. And then, I mean, you could keep doing this as many times as you want, but I'll make one more. One more. Like this, duplicate it across. And let's make this one sort of a, I don't know, somewhere in between. It's not straight, but it's not entirely squiggly either. Something like that. They kind of get weird shaped, right? And I'll just change the height of it as well or the size of it, the length of it. Something like that. Okay, cool. Now, you may have noticed that this is not reflected on our donut. And that is because, because we are still referencing the one single sprinkle in our object mode. And obviously you could swap this out for a different sprinkle, but we cannot use more than one object. And that's because this is the wrong node. What we need to use instead is not an object info, but a collection info node and reference a collection, which will be our sprinkles. So first of all, we need to move our sprinkles to a collection. So I'm going to select them all. Let me just grab a drink here. Ah, there we go. Now I'm going to move it to a new collection by hitting M, M for move. Um, you could also do it over here, M, and then hit new collection. And I'm going to type in sprinkles and then okay. Okay, so they're now all moved into here. So now if I was to uh, take my collection here and just like before, click and drag this over to here, you can see it's now added in a collection info node with our new sprinkles uh, selected. Um, and by the way, I, I mentioned it briefly at the start, but a collection is, it's, it's like a folder. It's like a bucket. It's just a way to organize things. You could put, you know, your camera, your lights in here and create another collection and put your donut in it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in this case, yeah, it helps us because we're going to reference it over here. So now I'm going to take this and put this, of course, into our instance. Haha, <gasps> what happened? <laughs> so that's not what we intended. Basically, for something like this, we need to, first of all, make sure that pick instance is enabled for our instances on points. Um, that will actually reference, not load in each one as individual, like unique data things. It'll just make it a lot faster to render. So make sure pick, pick instance is enabled and then separate children so that we're not referencing all five of the sprinkles on each point, which is one of them, and then reset children so that it then uses it like basically it applies it to here, not based on the distance from there to there, basically. Anyway, you just basically need to check those three things. Pick instance, reset children, separate children. And there we go. That looks pretty good. Um, it's the first time I've actually used this like really long one. And I don't know if I like it <laughs> because it's now it's introducing a lot of clipping. So I've changed my mind, but that's okay. You can change your mind because it's 3D. You know, if we painted this, in 2D, we would have some trouble. There we go, that's better. Okay, I'm happy with that. Cool, now if we went to uh, back to our rendered mode here, you can see we've got uh, some white, 
white Tic Tacs coming all over our donut. So, uh, of course, we could add a new material. Um, we could just make this one, you know, orange. We could make this one, or like, you know, one like this. We can make this one blue, you know, and that does the job. Unfortunately, though, you'll see that every time now this squiggly one here is referenced, as an example, it's now a blue one. So that will kind of look repetitive to your eye because the eye will notice that like, hmm, all of these squiggly ones look blue and then all of the straight ones look orange and then all of the blah, blah, blah. That's not what we want. We want to assign a unique color irregardless of which one of these objects it is. So let's delete that material. Let's keep this one. I'm gonna call this one sprinkles and I'm going to make all of these objects share this one material color irregardless of which one of these objects it is. So let's delete that material. Let's keep this one. I'm going to call this one sprinkles and I'm going to make all of these objects share this one material. You could do it one by one by coming over here and then clicking uh, sprinkles like that um, and selecting it from the list or much faster way, select all the objects you want to have as the new material, then select the object you want to copy the material from the last, then hit control L for link and then hit link materials. And now they are all using the exact same material. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, now it might not look like what we want, but let's go to the shading tab and we're going to do something fancy. Okay. So obviously these are now all one solid color, not what we want. What we want to do is in here, base color, we, got, we want to add something that will randomize the color dependent on what object it is. Like every time the object is referenced, pick a new thing. So the way we can do this is with a object info node. And again, this is one of those things is like, how would you know this is the one? because in like geometry nodes, there was a random value node. Hmm. It's just one of those things you just have to learn, I guess. But in, the way we can do this is with a object info node. And again, this is one of those things is like, how would you know this is the one? Because in like geometry nodes, there was a random value node. Hmm. It's just one of those things you just have to learn, I guess. But in shading, you use the object info node and then you take the random 
one at the bottom there. Okay, so it's I guess it's because it's object data and it's using random object data depending on the object. So I guess it does kind of make sense. Then if I take that and I put that into my base color, what this is doing now is it is referencing between zero and one. When it is zero, it is saying it is black. When it is one, it is saying it is white. And obviously all these other gray values is anywhere in between that. So each one of these has its own unique color, but very depressing looking colors. Um, it's not, no kid's going to pick that one at the, at the donut shop. One more sec. Yeah, you could make it look really sad, couldn't you? It's like, wah, wah, wah. Do you want to have the world's saddest donut, Johnny? Come on. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> what we can do instead, as I mentioned before, there is a node that we use a lot, and that is Shift A, Converter, Color Ramp. Now, if I put this in between here, it's still using the zero to one, but it's now converting it through a color ramp. So everything that is on the zero end of the scale will get this color. Everything that is on the white end, white, the one end of the scale will get this color, okay? So instead, um, I could make these colors anything I want. I can make this one red, I can make this one you know, blue, something like that. And look at that, haha, -ha, we have something in. interesting so uh, al already we've got really nice looking colors but you can see that you know some of these ones like the, the difference in color between this one this one and this one they're similar but they're all slightly different and of course that is because it's using an independent value somewhere in this gradius uh, gradient gradient yes that's the word I'm looking for um, and that's not how uh, sprinkles are made. Sprinkle values are constant. It is either orange or it is white. It is not a, somewhere a blend between orange and white because, as I said before, it is piped royal icing, generally speaking. Royal, I, th I think it is. My wife does cookies. Um, but royal icing, and then it's hardened, and then you do like a, another line of a different color. So you have to like mix it in like food dye and then do it out. Basically, it's, it's one constant color. So Instead of linear, if we change the uh, color ramp gradient type to be constant, there will then be no gradient, okay? It's now, it's, it's just basically one of these values. It's either blue or it is either red, and that is what we want. So now, if I was to add another value just by hitting the plus button, I could add new colors. And this is where it's really fun. You can finally have fun. You can be creative with your, uh, your donut. <clears throat> I feel like I'm losing the uh, color ramp gradient type to be constant there will then be no gradient okay it's now it's it's just basically one of these values it's either blue or it is either red and that is what we want so now if i was to add another value just by hitting the plus button i could add new colors and this is where it's really fun you can finally have fun you can be creative with your uh, your donut <clears throat> i feel like i'm losing my voice in the middle of this tutorial muscle through it all right, let's make this one a purple color. By the way, here's a pro tip. Don't use 100% saturation ever. <laughs> Generally, like 0.8 is really all you ever need. So somewhere around that. And let's make this one 0.8 somewhere, something about that. And then let's make this one yellow. And this is, yeah, you can have fun with it, right? I'm gonna go for a color scheme, which is, let's go sort of a pink color. Uh-huh, that's looking nice. And then you could go with like a white color as a final one. And you can see that the great thing about this one is, is I can now control how many uh, colors of each that I get. Like if there's too many, if I think there's too many purple ones, I could, you know, increase it and make it like now there's more blue. Um, or I could go like this way and make like there's more pink ones or there's more yellow ones or there's more white ones. So you can have creative control of it. And in fact, this is actually recommended like as a sort of an art rule. You never wanna go like, when you're using colors, you don't wanna use the same amount of each color. You actually wanna use, like, I actually got a video on color schemes. If you wanna watch it, you can click up there and watch it. Um, but yeah, it explains, you know, if you're gonna use like, like a complementary color scheme or something like that, you don't go like, you know, purple that goes with the yellow and you use like 50, 50 of each, it looks nasty. You wanna go like 90% of one color and then 10% of another. So anyways. Something fun there. Um, 
yeah I mean guys that's going to do it for this this really the the style and visual look of your donut it's all here um so if you want to make it your own now is your chance like you could change it and make it like a uh chocolate donut right I'm gonna, by the way, I didn't explain this, but you can like click and drag any color from one to another and it'll like copy it, which is cool. Um, you could make it like a Halloween donut that's like red and, um, ooh, I don't know, spooky. Oh, that looks like a, yeah, it kind of looks like a 4th of July donut or something. I see a lot of 4th of July decoration. I want to go to a 4th of July party one day. I've been to America a few times. I don't think I've been there during 4th of July. Looks like it'd be fun eating a lot of uh, sugary foods and hanging out, having a barbecue, setting off fireworks. We don't have fireworks here in Australia. They're illegal, along with many other things. <laughs> we can't even have gel blasters. Our government's like, no, 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 no. We're going to side with uh, Syria, North Korea, and Kuwait by also banning gel blasters. <laughs> it's... And Singapore as well. All right, so we're, we're in there with Singapore, but it's like, we can't be trusted with anything. Don't let us have anything. But uh, anyways. Um, but yeah, have, have some fun with it, guys. Um, this is your chance to uh, make it your own before we start animating it and uh, and doing stuff. There was a guy on Twitter who was actually like, <laughs> he was like mad that I was making another donut tutorial. And he was like, are you actually going to encourage people this time to make the donut their own? I'm sick of seeing all these pink donuts. <laughs> I was just laughing. Because I like that like someone out there, like that's how they start their day. You know, they just like open up Twitter and they're just seeing pink donuts. And they're like, Arr! I said no more pink donuts. So, you know, first of all, he didn't watch the last one, obviously, because it was the same instruction. I said, like, make it your own. Have some fun, you know. But, you know, that's Twitter. Um, oh, and one final thing I forgot. Uh, the ball balls. Ball balls? That's for a Christmas tree. But the balls, because uh, something I really like uh, that I saw on Pinterest was this one. I like the way that the balls sort of break up the, um, I don't know, just the repetitiveness of the sprinkles. So I did it for the last tutorial. I'll do it here as well. I'm gonna mess around with the sprinkle colors. If I'm being honest, chocolate dip donuts are the superior donut, and I will support that. And uh, as you can imagine, it is, you know, you add a sphere. So let's go shift A, sphere, UV sphere. That's icosphere, which is used occasionally when you feel like it. I don't know. You'll, you, you'll get the hang of it, but usually you want a UV sphere. Um, and it's ginormous by default. So let's just scale that in. You could also do it, you know, when you add in the sphere, but, you know, I usually forget. Okay, scale it in and then okay so then I'm gonna shade smooth of course and let's give it a material let's go blue something like that I have no idea why my sphere is so freaking giant okay I mean it doesn't explain it but 
I suppose it just didn't like that I was trying to do that in the wrong mode. Also, that doesn't belong there. Whoa. Ah, of course it's the freaking... Of course it's in the plane. Come on, man. Okay, we're in object mode. Nothing is selected. There we go. And then... Why is it doing that? In this collection. I don't know. That was weird. I mean, the one that was in this was like a, almost like metallic, but eh, I kind of like it like this. I might just lower the saturation a little bit and the roughness. I'll make it like a sort of a hard, a hard lolly like that. Cool. Now, if we were to move this into our sprinkles collection, then, oh, okay. It is actually working. It's just that this sphere is, uh, we haven't cleared the, the scale. So if I was to Clear the scale. There we go. Now we can actually see them on our drone. They were there. They were just so big that they were out there. Um, you can see that it's now for every, you know, every, what is this? One, two, three, four, five. Every six sprinkle, it's using one of these balls. Um, still a little too big. And they, I mean, this was an area that actually particles had an advantage because there was use count. If you followed the last tutorial, where you could say like basically the ratio of which, like the number of objects that spread out in a particle system. You can do it with geometry nodes, but it is incredibly difficult, way too complex, and I want to keep it simple. And look, honestly, we don't need that many. <laughs> we really only want like three or four on the whole donut. So I say just move it out of the sprinkles collection and then just actually physically put it on the donut like this. Move it across, um, you know, like that. And here's a pro tip. You never want to use like two of something. It just kind of looks like, like that would look too balanced, right? So it's better to have uh, three or four in this case. Um, and you also don't want to have it like a triangle like this. It looks like they've been too evenly placed. You want to make it look a little more plausible, you know, like someone tossed it onto the donut. So maybe one here. And then I'll chuck one at the bottom as well. Like so. And that'll do it and play with the colors if you want, but uh, you could also play with the sizes. I think this one, they actually got like a few big ones and then a few small ones as well. I'm just gonna go with the big ones, um, but that's gonna do it. So when you finished making the donut look cool, uh, go ahead, click here, and we are going to start animating. I mean, I like it. I like where we are. Let's save this and see if I can speed run it for uh cupcake
and then we'll catch up with that after. Okay. So, with this one, I'm going with a lot more uniform shapes. Uh, my nose and sniffles are absolutely disgusting. I am not going to be on the mic for long. Basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to get some circles and I'm going to get some stars and we're going to we're going to call it after that and that's going to be the shapes of the sprinkles. They're going to be little, going to be different and that's what we're going for boys and girls and everyone else. I suppose. That's how that works. I like it. Cool. What was that? What did I hear that one time? Guys, gals, other pals. I'm just gonna stop.
hitting this. So I'll see you there. To make better renders, you often need better assets, which is why I created Polygon, a library of models, textures, and HDRs that work in any 3D software. Join for free at polygon.com. With our donut now finished and looking the way we want it, we can now start animating it. So you might remember from the first part, this is the animation that we are going for. We wanna have it slowly rotate and then pick up speed into a quick spin and then go back to the start. Um, so it's, it's an opportunity to learn about keyframing essentially. So first uh, let's delete the plane because we no longer need that. That was just so that we could uh, play with lighting and see how it looks. Um, we're gonna have it operate just in a you know suspended in midair. Uh, so first of all, let's move our camera to be sort of front on to it like this. Okay, so um, there's a couple of ways you could like, you know, you could move it, position it, you know, like this. It's a little bit fiddly and then you'd have to like zero out these. I find it easiest if I want it to be like exactly front onto something. Uh, go to the front view, number pad one, or by clicking up there. Then uh, go to view, align view, align active camera to view or the hotkey control alt number pad zero. And you can see that we are now, it has snapped our camera to the exact location that we were at, which was front view. So now you should see that our camera, assuming our camera is selected, it should show 90 degrees zero zero. Okay, lovely. Cool, so um, now let's, uh, let's rotate our camera, our donut to position our camera. So if we were to rotate this, you can see that's, yeah, these objects are just moving independently of themselves because there is nothing that we've told Blender to say that this should be attached to this. Um, oh, and I've got this set to the wrong way. Um, you could, if you wanted to, you know, like rotate them all like this, but then they've each got their own individual like rotation amounts and it would just be a nightmare to animate with. So instead, let's, let's tell Blender that these are all linked. So I'm gonna select my icing, okay? And then I'm going to select a last, holding down shift, the, the object which is gonna be the parent, the, the one that it's, it's sort of based on. So that's my base, so icing, then shift select the base, and then I'm gonna hit control P for parent, okay? And there's a bunch of options here. Normally the ones you want is either that one or this one, depending on if you hit uh, object and then it just like moves around. It usually means like your rotation or your scale was not applied, but um, if it is applied, then object should work, but otherwise keep transform. Okay, so now that that's done, I can select my donut and the icing will move it with it. And I can select my icing and the donut underneath it will stay stationary. But you can see that there's a dotted line that connects between that and the base, just to show that it is parented to that thing. Okay. So uh, now I need to do the same for these balls because that was not part of the geometry nodes. So select the balls, holding down shift. And then, I mean, you could parent it to the base, but it actually make more sense to parent it to the icing. So control P, object because that means that if for whatever reason I wanted to move the icing, like, I don't know if it was in the wrong place slightly, or I wanted to move it up a little bit, um, I wouldn't have to reposition these balls. So it's called object hierarchy or parent hierarchy. So when you've got like a, like a mech or a robot or something, you might have like lots of elements, like a, a costume and some plate of armor and then like a hat. And you wanna have the hat that's like parented to the plate of armor and then the plate of armor that's parented to the mesh and then the mesh that's parented to the... So then when you move things, it actually makes sense and you don't have to like think and go, oh, this should be parent, you know. So anyways, that's just a long way of showing you how to do parenting. Okay, so. Looking through my camera view with uh, number pad zero, or just by clicking the little camera icon, um, I want to rotate my donut. So I wanna rotate it towards me. So that would be the X axis like this. I can also just uh, up here in your properties. Uh, yeah, just add, increase the uh, angle amount. And we're gonna go for something around about like 60. Yeah, what, yeah, let's go 60. Okay, 60 degrees. Okay, and now if I was to rotate this, that looks, Pretty good, haha, <laughs> nice. Okay, now you can see that we are in widescreen mode. Um, and you can see that might be good if you were rendering a Blu-ray of a donut spinning or a, a movie or something like that. Um, it makes sense that that's the default, but we are gonna do, we're gonna commit a sin. We're gonna use vertical mode, <gasps> shock and horror. Um, <laughs> it's kind of funny that like, Remember like when vertical video start, like people started recording video in vertical mode, there was like this huge pushback against vertical video, like everyone hated it. And now because of TikTok and Instagram and uh, what else, YouTube shorts, like vertical is its own format now. 
um, because a lot of people now watch video on their phone in vertical mode. So it doesn't really matter that it's vertical. But anyway, it's just kind of funny that we've all just like forgotten that we used to hate vertical video. <laughs> Some people I'm sure still hate it, but whatever. Um, okay, so we could change from widescreen mode to anything else by changing the resolution of our output up here. So the camera resolution is defined by your output for when you actually uh, render here. So if I was to adjust this, you can see that I'm changing the, uh, the aspect ratio of my camera. I could go ultra widescreen. All right, so what I'm gonna go for is uh, 1080 because that's what that one is now. And then if I made this 1920 by your output for when you actually uh, render here. So if I was to adjust this, you can see that I'm changing the, uh, the aspect ratio of my camera. I could go ultra widescreen. All right, so what I'm gonna go for is uh, 1080 because that's what that one is now. And then if I made this 1920, that would be an exact, is it exact? It depends on the phone, but a, a vertical mode. Um, I don't necessarily want completely vertical mode. I'm gonna go 1440, which is a, I don't know, semi-squarish looking one, because I find that if you make it just like 1920, then you end up with a lot of empty space up here and a lot of empty space down there. I don't wanna go for that entirely. Okay, and the next thing to decide is your focal length of your camera. So um, just to make this a little easier to understand, I'm just gonna quickly add in, hey, let's add in a monkey, just so that we know what we're talking about here. Um, when you're working with a scene and you've got you know, lots going on, um, but we don't in this case, but we've got a donut which is gonna be spinning, so things will look uh, different depending on where we are. Um, we could, for example, whoops, change how it looks to the camera. Um, by changing the focal length. So if I went for a really wide focal length, like let's say like 24 millimeters or something. Now when I bring this in like this, you can see that this, uh, I mean, actually maybe it would make more sense if I just rotate this a little bit towards the way that it, it was before. Now you can see it's almost like that, uh, like that skater cam, like a uh, fisheye lens kind of thing. So the things that are closest to the camera look like really distorted, like they're kind of like wide. And then the things that are not that far behind it look a lot further away. Um, it can look like distorted, but depending on what you're going for, it might actually look good for what, for what you want. Um, and you can see that I actually have clipping that's <laughs> happening pretty severely. And uh, that's because my clipping amount is too too high for the start. So I'll just add a zero in front of it and now I can move the camera much closer. Okay, so that is one look, right? Now the alternative is you could have the camera really far away and then you could use a large focal length. And now you can see that it's kind of flattened out, right? Like it's hard to actually tell like without lighting, let's say with all these here, like where the objects are in relation to each other, right? Like this monkey is much further forward than this one behind it, but because we're so far away, you can't see the depth. So when you're thinking of a focal length, just think a high focal length means I'm gonna flatten it. I'm gonna compress the depth so that basically things just look really, really flat. Like I could go really flat, move the camera even further away. And now all those monkeys basically look the same height, even though they're the same distance, although they're much, much further away from each other. Um, and then if you wanna exaggerate it and make things yeah, like a fisheye lens, like a skater cam kind of thing, you would use a smaller one, right? You just have to move the camera once you've changed, obviously, because it now has to be closer to fill the frame. In this case, I'm gonna make it something in between. I'm just gonna make it a 40. So the default is 50, but as it rotates around, I wanna kinda add, yeah, there's a little bit of depth to it, right? So I'm going with a 40 focal length. Delete these monkeys, because I no longer need them. I don't know if it was even helpful for the demonstration, but whatever. Um, all right, and now let's move my camera. By the way, here's a little tip. If you want to uh, see, you know, what is the center of your frame with your camera selected, if you go to composition guides, and then there's one here for center, you can see I now get like a little crosshair in the middle there. Um, you can also use like rule of thirds if you want to see the rule of thirds, which wouldn't make sense for something where you've just got one single object. Just keep it in the center. Diagonal, I don't know who uses diagonal. Look at that, it's a real cr crosshair now. Um, Anyways, okay, so now I'm gonna move my camera in a little closer. Yeah, that's pretty good. And then I'll just rotate this back to what it was before, which was around about 60. Okay, lovely. So um, with lighting, I mean, look, we're gonna do the lighting later on. Um, we're just gonna look in solid view and do some animation. Okay, 
So animation and playback can actually be done anywhere. So we're in layout mode, we've got 3D view, we could play our animation. So down here, this is the timeline, which we haven't really talked about yet. Um, but you can see we've got a, a timeline, which I can click up here, click on that little black part, and then you can click and drag across frames and you can hit spacebar to play your animation. And nothing is happening because obviously we haven't got any keyframes, any motion yet. Um, but you can see we are playing back an animation. Now, a quick point about playback, okay? So playback is defined by your frames per second because these are frames here. You can see it's not seconds, it is frames. So um, if you go to your output settings here, you can see your frame rate. So if I wanted a 10 second animation at 24 frames per second, that means I would need 240. We haven't got any keyframes, any motion yet. Okay. So animation and playback can actually be done anywhere. So we're in layout mode, we've got 3D view, we could play our animation. So down here, this is the timeline, which we haven't really talked about yet, um, but you can see we've got a, a timeline, which I can click up here, click on that little black part, and then you can click and drag across frames, and you can hit spacebar to play your animation. And nothing is happening because obviously we haven't got any keyframes, any motion yet. Um, but you can see we are playing back an animation. Now, a quick point about playback, okay? So playback is defined by your frames per second because these are frames here. You can see it's not seconds, it is frames. So um, if you go to your output settings here, you can see your frame rate. So if I wanted a 10 second animation at 24 frames per second, that means I would need 240 frames. So uh, you can see the start and end frames here, that is the number of frames in your animation. So if you were to hit render animation, it would render all the frames from 100 to uh, 250. So if I wanted 10 seconds, I would set that to 240. Um, so uh, the, the the playback speed, this is a, you know, the, the, the frame rate that you choose, I mean, it's a, <laughs> it's, it's almost like a religious war. You remember when uh, The Hobbit came out, uh, they came out with 48 frames a second, which is double the standard for cinema, which is 24. Some people loved it, some people hated it. Um, 24 used to be sort of the standard, then like a lot of camcorders and stuff came out at like, like TV was 30 uh, or 29.97. That's a whole other thing. They, <laughs> the American market added in color and then they had to find a way to fit that into these cathode CRT things. Very crazy, but sort of like 30. Um, and then there's like now 60. YouTube is now, you can show 60 frames a second. So again, some people love that, some people hate it. My final donut animation, I actually used 60 frames a second because I find for like animations, it kind of makes it feel like larger than life. Like it's kind of like, whoa, like hyper real. It's kind of like popping out of the screen. Only downside to that is you need to render twice as many frames as 30 frames a second. So I wouldn't actually necessarily recommend it. Um, so we're gonna use 30 frames a second, which is sort of standard for what you would get on a phone or a camcorder or anything like that today. Um, camcorder feels so old school to say camcorder, but a camera, you know, DSLR or anything, it's usually around about 30. So we're gonna go, we're gonna go 30. So if we were to, uh, if we wanted to do an animation, uh, we could do it anyway. So we could put, put our timeline, a little slider thing back on frame one. And then if I want to add a keyframe for my donut here, I could hit I. So that is in I for insert keyframe, which is we're gonna go, we're gonna go 30. So if we were to, uh, if we wanted to do an animation, uh, we could do it anyway. So we could put, put our timeline, a little slider thing back on frame one. And then if I want to add a keyframe for my donut here, I could hit I. So that is in I for insert keyframe, which is not the uh, most obvious <laughs> keyframe choice. It could be K, that would make more sense to me, but it's I. Um, and then you could say, what, what sort of keyframe are you using it for? Are you doing it for the location, the scale or the rotation? I've never used any of these, to be honest. Um, the one I'm looking for is, in this case, I'm just gonna say location. I'm just doing this to show you something. Um, okay, so if I wanted, uh, let's say three seconds of animation, I'm at 30 frames a second, three times 30 would be 90 frames. So I would then move to where I want the action to end, and then I would move my object to that point, and then say I again, and then say location. Then if I went back to the start here, which you can do by hitting shift left arrow, and then hit spacebar, you can see that we are playing back. Haha, ha, lovely. So the 
30 frames a second. If we were to count this and go, okay, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, what's happening? Why is this not playing back at 30 frames a second? That is because Blender is trying to show you everything on your screen. And we've actually got quite a lot of complex detail here. You can see in the top left-hand corner, we've got frames per second, and it's lighting up as red to show you that there is actually frames that it's not, it's not playing back at its true speed. It can only render on my screen 12 frames a second. You might be able to get this down if you were to like turn off your subdivisions and like make things a little bit lighter. Oh, I can actually. So it was just that, it was that. Um, but if I did want to keep that, um, and I had a lot going on in my scene, which you often do, if you want to play something back at its true speed and not have to go through and like change, you know, everything in your scene, you would just go to playback and then say sync, play every frame to frame dropping. So now it will play it back at its proper speed, even though it, it'll start skipping frames in order to meet the requirements of playing back at 30 frames per second. Um, so there you go, a little bit about playback and how that all uh, works. Something else you might want if you are new to animation and frames don't really make sense, you want to uh, use seconds. You can also say view, show seconds, or just hit control T whilst your mouse is over here. And then you can see it's showing you actual seconds. You can go like, okay, I want three seconds of animation. I can get it to th uh, three seconds, right? Um, but generally you just want to render with, uh, show, show your frame count. Um, I don't know, I find it easier to work within seconds. Um, anyways, okay, cool. So we wanna have a donut that uh, that spins around. So first of all, I'm gonna position my donut to be where I want my, cause I'm gonna make this loop, which introduces some complications, but hey, that's what the tutorial is for, make, make it interesting. So um, it's gonna start at frame one and it's gonna be about this point. So this is where the video is gonna start. It's where the donut is sort of looking uh, interesting. So I'll be at about there. And then I'm going to hit I and then say insert location at rotation. Okay, then, hey, that's what the tutorial is for. Make, make it interesting. So um, it's gonna start at frame one and it's gonna be about this point. So this is where the video is gonna start. It's where the donut is sort of looking uh, interesting. So I'll be at about there. And then I'm going to hit I and then say insert location at rotation. Okay, then I'm gonna go up to I mean, we're gonna make it spin fast at the end to do like a, like a really quick spin. Um, and I'm gonna do that around about here to 10 is where it's gonna to start to speed up. So this is where sort of the, uh, like what's interesting to the donut has, has stopped showing. And then it starts to show the back of it, right? So I don't wanna show like a slow pan. around the back, spin fast at the end to do like a, like a really quick spin. Um, and I'm gonna do that around about here to 10 is where it's gonna start to speed up. So this is where sort of the, uh, like what's interesting to the donut has, has stopped showing. And then it starts to show the back of it, right? So I don't wanna show like a slow pan around the back. I want it to like speed up from this point. So now I'm gonna hit I again and hit rotation. Okay, so now we play that back. Go from here to there. So is it doing frame dropping? Yes, it is, okay. So this is the true playback speed. Okay, oh, I also want it to be 
um, 10 seconds of animation at 30 frames. That means I want to change my end frame count, which you can do there or over here. Set that to 300. Uh -huh. Also, if you just want to like, instead of having to scroll in and out here to see all your frames, if you just say home whilst your cursor is over here, um, same as if you want to see Uh, your entire scene it's home um yeah then it'll should actually did it show me all the frames that's odd huh i've never seen that before okay usually when you say home it like shows you the exact timeline view of everything but in this case it didn't now oh, maybe it's because of the keyframes maybe if i don't select keyframes eh, anyway i think blender's changed that i think it used to always show the timeline small thing doesn't matter all right let's move along now in this part, I want to do like a like a spin, and actually you can see at the start here, like it moves really slowly, then it moves fast in the middle, and then it starts to slow down again. So this is because these keyframes that it has added is a Bezier keyframe. So it's trying to blend into the next one, and because there's nothing here, it's just starting slowly and then ending slowly. So to see all this, it is better visualized in the animation uh, workflow up here. Work workspace is what it's called. All right, so it's got a 3D view over here and another one over here. I prefer to actually make this a uh, graph editor. Mm -hmm. So graph editor um, will show you the, the keyframes, but with like the Bezier curve information to show you where it's slowing down and speeding up. So to move around here, I'm holding down control and then middle mouse button. And it allows me, if I move it like all the way up to the right, I can sort of zoom in. And then to the left, I can sort of like pinch the, uh, the it's like sort of zooming out on the keyframes. And then I can go down and it can, it's just a, actually a really easy way to quickly see things. And then you can just say home if you want to see everything. Um, that's probably easiest, just hit home. Okay, now we're actually only animating on our Z axis but when you add a keyframe for the rotations you're also doing it for the x and the y and we don't actually need that so i'm going to delete those so with my mouse over these i'm going to hit x and then this one as well so we've just got um that's probably easiest just hit home okay now we're actually only animating on our z axis but when you add a keyframe for the rotations you're also doing it for the x and the y and we don't actually need that so i'm going to delete those so with my mouse over these i'm going to hit x and then this one as well. So we've just got the Z rotation. Okay, so we can see that it is, uh, that's how it's happening. Okay, great. Let's complete our animation before we start cleaning up this. So I want it to go to here. I'm gonna hit X and then this one as well. So we've just got the Z rotation. Okay, so we can see that it is, uh, that's how it's happening. Okay, great. Let's complete our animation before we start cleaning up this. So I want it to go to here. And then this is where I want it to start speeding up and do like an extra spin, an extra two spins, in fact. So uh, let's go up to, okay. So this is the degrees on the left-hand side. And then this is the keyframes on the uh, up top right. An extra two spins, in fact. So. Uh, let's go up to, okay, so this is the degrees on the left-hand side, and then this is the keyframes on the uh, up top right. Oh, and by the way, I didn't even explain what this is down here. This is your, what is it, action sheet? Is that what it's called? Dope sheet, dope sheet. Sounds like what you'd get for a criminal possession of drugs, <laughs> dope sheet. Um, okay, um, I thought it was called action sheet, but anyways, it's just like simple, be like uh, little dots, like keyframes, like what we had before on the ti timeline. Um, but this one up here, your graph editor will show you the actual motion of where it's blending in between keyframes. So I generally like to work with the uh, the graph editor. Okay, so I want it to do, um, let's do another rotation from here. So I'm going to, I mean, I could try to like rotate it up here, but it's actually easier to work. Um, I find it easier to work like this. So I'm gonna take, uh, I'm gonna add another keyframe up here by hitting control and then just left clicking. Did that not work? Right clicking, sorry. Okay, it's control and right click. That'll add another keyframe where you've got your cursor. So I could go like this and add keyframes everywhere if I want to. Okay, so I want it to basically speed up here. It's done one revolution. I actually want it to do two revolutions. So I want it to move up again to around about here. Now, lining this up would actually be very difficult. It is very difficult. Um, so we've got something that's starting at 
minus rotation, and then it's going up to here. And I want this to loop, right? So I want it to end at the exact point where it should join with the previous one. So I can actually find out the exact degree rotation for this by uh, selecting a keyframe and then hitting N in my properties to bring up this. So here I can see the value of this. So this is starting at the start of my animation. It is starting its rotation at minus 34.5 degrees. So let's just make that an easy number. Let's go minus 30, okay? Something a little easier to start. Yeah, let's go minus 40, minus 40. So it starts where it's a little bit Mm, do we want it minus 50? Yeah, let's go minus 50. Why not? Let's go minus 50, okay. And then up here, so how do I calculate? So how many revolutions, minus 50 to two revolutions, we can do some math, okay? Everybody loves math, it's exciting. I hated math in high school. My dad's actually like a maths professor. He had like did like his thesis on maths and science. I was just so disappointed that I failed, <laughs> almost failed at math and science. <laughs> Oh, uh, anyways, math. Okay, let's do some math. So we wanted to to do a from minus fifty. We wanted to do two revolutions. Okay, so we would type in here in this value three hundred and sixty for one revolution plus three hundred and sixty for a second revolution minus its original start at fifty, which brings us to six hundred and seventy degrees. So. Then the keyframe value here, because we just sort of like arbitrarily like dropped it wherever our cursor was. Um, I want to set this to be, um, you could set it to 300, but actually because we want it to loop, it would actually make sense for it to start off the timeline, which would be 301, 301 frames. So if we played this back now, it should be framed. Okay, so we've got to stop the, uh, the slow speed up at the start. We'll get to that, but let's just see how this looks. It should spin twice. And now it's back at the start. Aha. So it out. This is not correct. Plan has worked. There is no. like jutting cut. Where where it stops at the start. Sorry, before it, where it, um, I don't know, it jumps from when it goes to the end to the start, basically. It, it is actually the same frame, which is exactly what uh, we wanted. But we want to fix this, uh, Uh, this now it's control and right click arbitrarily like to be th hey that's what the tutorial is for make so is it doing frame dropping yes it is okay so this is the true playback speed okay oh I also want it to be th um, 10 seconds of animation at 30 it's been for make make it interesting so um, it's gonna start at frame one and it's gonna be about this point so this is where the video is gonna start it's where the donut is sort of of looking uh, interesting. You've got your cursor, so I could go like this and add keyframes everywhere if I want to. Okay, so I want it to basically speed up here. It's done one revolution. I actually want it to do two revolutions. So I want it to move up again to around about here. Now lining this up would actually be very difficult. It is very difficult. Um, so we've got something that's starting at 
minus, we bring up this. So here I can see the value of this. So this is starting at the start of my animation. It is starting its rotation at minus 34.5 degrees. So let's just make that an easy number. Let's go minus 30, okay? Something a little easier to start. Yeah, let's go minus 40. Minus 40. So it starts where it's a little bit, hmm, do we want it? Minus 50? Yeah, let's go minus 50. Why not? Let's go minus 50, okay. And then up here, so how do I calculate? So how many revolutions, minus 50 to two revolutions, we can do some math, okay? Everybody loves math. It's exciting. I hated math in high school. My dad's actually like a maths professor. He had like did like his thesis on maths and science. I was just so disappointed that I failed. <laughs> Almost failed at math and science. <laughs> oh, anyways. Math, okay, let's do some math. So we wanted to, to do a, from minus 50, we wanted to do two revolutions. Okay, so we would type in here in this value, 360 for one revolution, plus 360 for a second revolution, minus its original start at 50, which brings us to 670 degrees. So then the keyframe value here, because we just sort of like arbitrarily like dropped it wherever our cursor was. Um, I want to set this to be, um, you could set it to 300, but actually because we want it to loop, it would actually make sense for it to start off the timeline, which would be 301, 301 frames. So if we played this back now, it should be framed. Okay, so we've got to stop the, uh, the slow speed up at the start. We'll get to that, but let's just see how this looks. It should spin twice. And now it's back at the start. Haha. -ha. So it, our plan has worked. There is no like jutting cut where it stops at the start. Sorry, before it, where it, um, I don't know, it jumps from when it goes to the end to the start, basically. It, it is actually the same frame, which is exactly what uh, we wanted. But we want to fix this, uh, this speed issue. So it starts basically, it's stationary because its movement is so slow because of this Bezier handle here. So what I want to do is I want to make it like from here in the timeline. Can I do a, no, I can't do a, uh, I was trying to do an annotation. You can't do an annotation in the dope sheet apparently. Um, from here in the timeline to here, I want to make the, anim the motion look basically constant. So I'm going to grab this Bezier handle here and I'm just going to scale in. So scale it all the way in. And then I'm going to do the same thing here, but not for this entire point because I want this part to actually do smooth, just this handle. I'm going to scale that almost all the way in as well. Okay, so now if I play it, it should be basically constant from here to here. You could change the handle to a vector or something like that. I'm just gonna keep it like that, that's fine for me. Okay, then I want this, let's actually move this down so that it's actually the same, because if I go like this, you can see that there'll be like a jump from that amount of rotation to like the next bit. You can see like it, there's a bit of a jump there. So I want this handle to be basically in line with this blue line over there. And I'm dragging that over there so that there is now like a slow buildup to the next part. Ha ha, that's starting to look good. So it's a slow buildup. Okay, and then it starts to speed up. It's faster, faster. And there we go. So it's basically almost like a vertical bit here. In fact, I could just rotate this because then this will actually like, rather than it going back all the way to zero in terms of rotation, it should actually be um, keeping with basically this line. Like if you draw drew a line across there, we should try to get that same line here with this handle roughly. Okay, something like that. And I might just scale that out a little bit. And then I'll take this and I'll scale this one out a little bit. So it's like, where do you want the motion? Do you want it to be like here or do you want it Mostly here. Ah, oh, there we go. That's pretty good, actually. I like that. Just playing it back.
pretty cool. This was actually to decide this this animation because I'm creating some uh, some donuts for uh, an NFT project. I'll show you at the end what uh, what some of them look like. Um, but uh, yeah, this this idea because we're like trying to like figure out like okay, what's the best way to make it spin? Because if you have it just like constantly spinning, it's really boring when it gets to the the, the back part of the donut. And um, so yeah, I was like working with a contractor to like figure out you know how how should it actually look? And he came up with this idea where it like it starts to speed up at the end of it and then does this like revolution. And I thought like that's really cool. And then we made it so like some bits like fly off the donut as well. That's kind of an extra thing. Um, but anyways, that is pretty good. So that is the basics of animation. So we are going to get into uh, rendering uh, later on. Um, but yeah, that's going to do it for this video. So go. Cool. We did some learning. I'm still sick. Feel like garbage. I will catch up. Looks like probably either tomorrow or combined tomorrow and the next day. We're going to finish this and apply all of what we've learned as well to the cupcake. Uh, for now though, uh, I feel like garbage and so we're going to do that later. Um, yeah, a bit of a shorter one today. That's okay though.